peace of the Lord be with you. I want to welcome each of you to our worship service in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I just want to say how glad I am that each of you are here. What a beautiful day. It's so nice to be able to share in the warmth of God's presence and to feel the sun upon us. By the way, the CDC on outdoor events has lightened up the restrictions, so if you feel comfortable drop in your mask. You might go home without a half face sunburn. Um, you're welcome to do that today. Uh, during singing though, if you would put your masks on, that would be much appreciated. Our mission um, as a church is to make disciples who make a difference. Um, actually, I wanted to take a minute today to say thank you to a few people who make a difference in our church. There's actually hundreds of people who make a difference all the time, but I'm making it a goal for myself over the next several weeks to say thank you to at least three of you. Um, and I, I wanted to start um, by thanking Jason Cole, who has been our one of our key sound people since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, Alex is in there today and has stepped up in a big way recently, but Jason, for the past several months while we've been outside, has really helped to make it possible, and so I want to thank Jason. I also want to thank Karina Hoyt, who's our Sunday School Superintendent. We started Sunday School again for the first time outside today, and we had a great group of people. We did openers up on the patio, and uh, she helped to get all the teachers organized and has really helped to carry us through the pandemic with a lot of changes to our Sunday school program. Um, so to Karina Hoyt, we give you thanks and to all the teachers who are helping. And I also wanna thank Tim Paul, who's been teaching adult Sunday school all through the pandemic, whether it be outside on the patio or um, online through Zoom. Um, it's been such an amazing support to have his, his teaching going on all through that time but also he's a chair of the deacon board and has helped keep us organized as a deacon board, serving communion as we're doing today. So those three people came to mind today. But I thank all of you for your ongoing support of our ministries, even in the midst of these crazy times. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, so we'll be celebrating Holy Communion together. Um, we'll uh, invite you forward when that time comes to come to the table and there's small cups of juice and small cups of bread for each of you. If you're at home, you can organize yourself by getting your elements together so that we can share in communion with you as well. Regarding announcements today, the last today is the last day to sign up for Mother's Day roses. Uh, we've been really grateful for how many people have ordered them, uh, but in order, you order a rose in honor or memory of your mom if you'd like to. They're $5 and you just attach it to the sign-up sheet that's on the bulletin you either received via email or uh, when you came into worship today. Um, Psalm 100 verses one through two says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. May we all come into his presence with singing as we join in our first hymn. The church is one foundation.
You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? O oh God, our Lord Jesus Christ, we stand this morning on you, our one true foundation. You have made us into a new creation. You have taught us what love can be. We, together with every church around the world, are in awe of you. You have taken what is many and made us into one. You have overcome our divisions, our strife, our petty squabbles that so consume our attention and energy, and you have woven us together into a single garment of love, a blessing to the whole world. We confess that too often we focus on the things that divide us. Too often we build divisions for ourselves, keeping some out and depriving others of justice and peace. You have taught us to love, and instead, by what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have neglected your teaching, sinning against you and against each other. And we stand in need of your forgiveness. Grant us new life again. Give us clean hearts and minds so that we might serve you in gladness and singleness of purpose once again. God, our Father, in your goodness, you have welcomed us into communion with you. Through this table this morning, we know that you, Jesus, will meet us in a real, sacramental, mysterious way. Holy Spirit, you will nourish us and sustain us as we go out into the world to serve the needy, bring justice to the oppressed, and peace to the embattled, and rest to the weary. Equip us through our worship this morning and through the Lord's table to do this, as we say together the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Now I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's lesson. Come right down in here. Just watch the wires. Step over them. Good. Hi, Kelly. Can everybody see what I have today? You know what that is? It's it's a bell. But this is not just any bell. I actually just went to visit my mom in Minnesota. And she had a box of things from my dad who died a little while ago. And this was in it. And I said, oh, can I have the bell? This bell, when we were kids, your age, my brothers and sister and I, we used to go outside and play all the time. And we lived in a neighborhood where there were a lot of kids. So we used to go outside and play the whole time. But when dinner came, my mom would stand at the front door and open the door and ring this bell. And everybody in our neighborhood knew what that meant. The Bixby's were about to eat dinner. And I want to tell you something. When my mom rang that bell or my dad rang that bell, it didn't take us very long to get home. A, because we knew we were supposed to go home. But also, as you can tell, I didn't mind eating dinner, right? So we'd hear the bell, and we knew dinner was coming, and everybody else knew that, well, if we were playing a game or something, Bixby's no longer on second base. You know what I mean? It's time to rearrange things to make up for the loss of my brothers and I. But I wanted to say that bell represented a blessing. And the blessing was coming home and being with my family and sharing in a meal together. Today in the Bible reading we're going to hear related to the sermon, the Apostle Paul offered a blessing to the church in Colossae. He said, may, the stre strength, may you be strengthened by the strength, the glorious strength that God provides. May you be strengthened by the glorious strength that God provides. I was thinking about that blessing and how it's an important blessing for us today also. That God wants us to be strengthened, right, on our inside. He wants us to be strong, to be able to endure difficult things to be able to face challenges, to continue to do the good things that God wants us to do for each other and to each other. But we do that with God's blessing. Can we pray together? God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for each child here, for all the children who are here at church and at Sunday school today and all the children of our church whether they're here or not, and all the children of our world. May they all be strengthened with your glorious strength so they can face everything they need to face with your strength. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. You can go sit down. Now we have an opportunity to continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. You can give online at eccattleboro.org slash give. You can mail your checks in. Uh, you can also text the Attleboro to 77977 if you're into giving through your cell phone. Tithing is one of the ways that we can push back the stress and the anxiety that threaten to overwhelm us in stressful and anxious times. Tithing, giving our money back to God, reminds us that God is our security. God is our comfort, not amassing goods or money or things, but serving others with our goods, our money, our things, is how God serves us. 
And so we ask you today that you would be generous in your giving, that you would pray and uh, be thoughtful in your giving. Remember your home church if you are visiting us from another congregation. Remember also those organizations that are doing kingdom work in the community. Let's give joyfully and prayerfully today. Would you pray with me? Our God in heaven, we are so grateful for your, your provision for us. You have met our needs, and so we want to turn around and meet the needs of others. We know that right now needs are, are plentiful, and we trust that with what we offer today to you, you will multiply like loaves and fishes to impact this world for your good. So would you give us courage this morning to give boldly, to give faithfully? Would you quiet our own anxieties and our own anxious thoughts? We give you our whole self to serve you and to serve the world. Would you bless us, please? In your name we pray, amen. Now we invite you to join as uh, a time of response by singing to the They are printed in your... Please join us in singing praise. Thanks, Mark. Man of Sorrows, we're starting with. We're going to sing Man of Sorrows. Please stand if you are able.
be seated. Our scripture reading from this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 20. Paul begins his letter to the Colossians by giving thanks for their faithfulness and discussing the supremacy of Christ. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faithfulness in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love of the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard of it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that we might come to have the first place in everything, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're starting a sermon series today on the book of Colossians. And I don't know about you, but while Pastor Chris was reading, my head was hurting. There's so many deep concepts in the book of Colossians, and especially right at the beginning there, that theologians absolutely love this book. And I was talking to somebody yesterday at Men's Breakfast about reading the Bible, and one of the things I often suggest is read the Bible with the highlights. Go into your Bibles and highlight those verses that really stick out to you so that you can allow them to penetrate your heart and really sink in. And I think this is a good example of a book where that could be really helpful. And I was thinking about how the Lord's Supper has its roots in the Last Supper, which we just focused on in Lent. And the Last Supper has its roots in the Lord's Supper, which was celebrated uh, or as the Passover feast um, during the Passover when Jesus was crucified. But there's one interesting fact about the Passover feast, and that is that there are four cups that are a part of the celebration of Passover. And each cup 
comes with a separate promise from the Lord regarding the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt. The first cup is known as the cup of salvation. And the Lord's promise was, I will bring you out of Egypt. And most of us know that Egypt was a place where the Hebrew people were enslaved. And so the promise to take them out of Egypt was to have them be emancipated from slavery. But interestingly, the second cup is the cup of deliverance. And the cup of del deliverance came with the promise that you will, I will deliver you from slavery. Which is interesting because you would think that getting the people out of Egypt was getting the people out of slavery at the same time. But it's often been said that getting the people out of Egypt was one thing, but getting Egypt out of the people was something else altogether. And so deliverance is a process, not an event. The third cup in the Passover celebration is the cup of redemption. And the Lord's promise was, I will redeem you. And this was related to the fact that while the Hebrew people were in the wilderness, God gave them the law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments that Moses delivered to his people for the sake of their redemption while he was on Mount Sinai. The fourth cup is the cup of praise. And this is related to the promise that God gave to the Hebrew people that he would be their God and they would be his people. It was a celebration of the fact that God made his people out of this exodus from Egypt into freedom. And I was struck by this as I was reflecting on it during Lent, that when we celebrate Ho Holy Communion with the one cup, we're celebrating all four of those things that we find in the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord. Our salvation, our deliverance, our redemption, and our praise. And in the book of Colossians, Jesus or Paul was essentially telling the people in the church there that Jesus was the source of all these things. As a matter of fact, he even goes as far back as saying he is the source of our life and also that he holds all things together. One of the interesting things about Paul's letter to the church in Colossae is that he did not ever go to that city. He was not the person who started the church there. Um, a man named Epaphras, who we hear about in the midst of this letter, is actually the person who started the church of the Colossians. And Epaphras was a person who actually came from this small town that Epaphras went and heard um, Paul preaching, probably in Ephesus, and when he came back, he brought the message of the gospel to his people. And so that's how the church started, and it's believed that Epaphras went and visited Paul in prison and shared his concerns with Paul, and that's the reason Paul wrote this letter. You see, one of the big concerns that Epaphras apparently had with regard to the church in Colossus was that they had been so influenced by the Roman understanding of the Greek gods that they were having a hard time believing that Jesus was God, that he was equal to God, that he was, that he was to be held up above all the other gods that they were worshiping at the time. The Greeks believed in a spiritual world but it was complicated and multi-layered. And this is why in Second Corinthians or in Colossians 2:8, Paul said, See to it that no one takes you captive with philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tra traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. 
And then in verse 19 of chapter 2, Paul writes about the cross. And he says, through the cross, Christ disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. Now, in the Roman mind, they thought Caesar was the Lord. They used the word Lord in relationship to Caesar. And so using Lord in relationship to Jesus was a difficult thing in some ways. But when the Romans overtook another country militarily, they didn't have the Internet and Facebook to put them on display. So what they did was they took the army of the other country and stripped them of their armor and made them parade through the city to show that they had been disarmed to show that the Romans were victorious and the more powerful. And here Paul is saying, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and made public example of them, triumphing over them. So he wasn't victorious over a group of people. He wasn't trying to take power over the world through land and occupation, but rather through spiritual superiority and supremacy over all other spiritual forces. And Paul was saying that through the cross, Christ had truly been triumphant. And so you can imagine Epaphras talking to Paul in prison about this and saying, I am struggling to convince them that Jesus was not less than God. And Paul says, I'll write a letter. And you can see Paul sitting down and writing this letter where he lets them know exactly what he thinks and understands about who Jesus is. And this is where in chapter 1, verse 15 through 20, he describes Christ in this way. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers or all things have been created through him and for him. That's the part that I said my head was hurting while Chris was reading. Because each one of those words is packed with so much meaning. And it's because Paul was trying to reveal to them the mystery of Christ. That this isn't lighthearted stuff. This is deep and powerful and forceful. He says, all things have been created through him and for him. You may remember in the first chapter of John, verses 1 through 2, John wrote this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Sometimes when I teach confirmation, I ask our students to replace the word word with Jesus, and it helps make more sense out of that sentence. He says, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. You see, this is what Paul was saying in his letter to the Colossians when Paul wrote, all things have been created through him and for him. And then he said, he himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So according to Paul, Jesus created all things and sustains all things. So he's essentially the center of our lives. He's the center of our universe. And he's supposed to be the center of all things for us as well. He holds all things together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might hold first place in everything. So he not only is the center of all things, but as we live our lives, our lives will be at their best if we seek to make the Christ the center of our lives in this world that's typically far more self-centered than Christ-centered. What Paul was saying is that the church exists because of Jesus and for Jesus, and we need to trust in power and stay focused on him. This is why Paul suggests that Jesus be given first place in everything, first place in our lives, 
first place in our work life, first place in our relationships, first place in our marriages, first place in our families, first place in everything that we do, that we prioritize him. Another word for this sometimes gets translated preeminence, that we give Christ preeminence in our lives, that we make him the center of our existence. Paul is calling us to live Christ-centered lives in a self-centered world. Let me say it again. Paul is calling us to live Christ-centered lives in a self-centered world. Paul says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of his cross. The word reconciliation is a really important theological word that's kind of hard to understand. So I'm going to go back to confirmation again with our 7th and 8th graders. We talk about if a boy, like if two kids break up in their relationship in middle school, they were dating each other and then they break up. When they get back together, that's reconciliation. Right, So if they break up and then the boy apologizes to the girl and then there's forgiveness, then they're reconciled. But it takes true forgiveness for reconciliation to take place. It takes an offering of forgiveness for it to happen. And this is what the blood of Christ is all about. Jesus died on the cross so that we could be reconciled with God to offer us forgiveness so that our, re- our relationships could be made right with him. So according to the first chapter in Colossians, Jesus not only created us and sustains us, but he redeems us by reconciling us to God, our Father. It says, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. What that means is that Jesus was equal with God. He wasn't just some high and mighty angel. He wasn't a divine expression like the Greek gods were thought to be. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. One of the parts of reading the letter to the Colossians, the hard parts, is that some of these concepts, like I said, are hard to sink your teeth into. You could spend a few days meditating just on the first chapter of Colossians. But there's one part that kind of brings it down to earth in my mind. And it's the blessing that I was referring to in the children's message today. It's in chapter 1, verse 11. And we know it's Paul's blessing because he begins the words with may you. Whenever you see the words may you, in the Bible, it typically means a blessing is coming. And so Paul writes, May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. This blessing is twofold. First, he says, may you be strengthened. And second, he says, may you endure. May you be made strong by the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience. And by everything, I think he means the stuff in life that just isn't easy. There's so much about our lives that are difficult. And that's why we need his strength, but it's also why we need patient endurance. But he's also talking about the things that are difficult that we add to our lives by becoming disciples of Jesus. When we decide to 
follow Jesus and make Jesus first in all things in our lives. We decide to live less self-centeredly. Is that a word? Less self-centeredly by moving ourselves out of the center of our existence and putting Jesus in the center, we're saying we're going to live a different kind of life. And we know Paul has integrity that with this because he's sitting in prison writing this letter. And the reason why he was in prison was because he was standing up for his faith in a place that didn't understand it. So sometimes as Christians, we actually add difficult things to our lives to live fully and faithfully in relationship to him. It means that we stop putting our interests ahead of the interests of our neighbor. We're less competitive and more cooperative. We decide to make other people a priority over ourselves. And we make these sacrifices with God's blessing. If we truly receive that blessing, we can have the strength not just to face the suffering of our ordinary lives, but also to choose the extraordinary suffering that is required to be a true disciple of Jesus. The good news is summarized in verses 13 through 14, right after this blessing, when he says, God the Father has rescued us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I don't know why I've been talking about confirmation all day, but this last week we were talking about this very passage and I asked him, what tense was that written in? Was it talking future tense, present tense, or past tense? Let me read it again. God the Father has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. What do you think? Raise your hand if that's future tense. Present tense? Past tense. That's it. It's past tense. It's already happened. Through Christ Jesus, we have been transferred out of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. If you call yourself a Christian today, this already exists in your life right now. And what it means is that you no longer belong to this self-centered world, but you belong to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you are a citizen of heaven right now. Not tomorrow, not after you die. Right now, you belong to Jesus. You are his child. You are a citizen of his kingdom. You've been transferred out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. You belong in heaven more than you belong here on earth. The hard part is that we still have to endure earth. We still have to endure the craziness of this world. We still have to endure the pressures of being a human being and of being a Christian. In this world, we're called to live Christ-centered lives in a self-centered world. That's the theme, not just of the sermon today, but of our sermon series in general. And I believe of the book of Colossians. We're called to live Christ-centered lives in a self-centered world. And when we go to the table, we're reminded of our citizenship in heaven that we belong to Jesus and we belong to the kingdom of his beloved son. All people who put their trust in Jesus are welcome at this table regardless of denominational affiliation. We're invited to come into fellowship with and through each other. I was reading an article last week. It was about what people are missing if they haven't been able to worship together. The number one response was sharing in communion in person. 
A close second was our conversations in the foyer or narthex of our church. Fellowship and communion go hand in hand. And I invite you to this table as we prepare our hearts for the bread and the cup together. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. So come to this sacred table not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and that you desire to be one of his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because we are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in our frailty and sin we stand in constant need of his mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek his presence and power. Now let's join together in affirming our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand together? It should be printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, earth and And in in Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, his his only only Son, Son, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. From From thence thence he shall shall come come to to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now hear the words of our Lord Jesus as they were delivered by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray together. If you're at home and you have your elements in front of you, just lift your hands over them. And I invite all of you to just lift your hands over the elements that we'll partake of together. Loving God, this bread, you express your eternal love. And through this cup, you reveal your redemptive power. Help us now to hear the firm voice of this bread and this cup calling us to lives of integrity and pointing us toward eternity. Teach us how to come to this table so that we may discard our passive faith, set aside our spectator attitudes, and be with our Lord as he fills this cup of forgiveness. Teach us to act forgiven and to be thankful for it. Teach us to receive this bread and this cup and to find fellowship with and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Uh, This morning, if you're here in our parking lot, we ask that you would come form a a socially distanced line by every table. You'll come up and uh, receive the bread and the cup together. If you can then make your way to one of the garbage stations to throw away the cups, that would be helpful. All is prepared.
Take and eat. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. And this is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink of it in remembrance of him.
I serve communion directly to two people this morning. And it happened because that person and her daughter haven't been in church in a really long time. And it's because of some, she grew up in our church and had some difficult uh, experiences and it led her to be away. And she shared with me that she hadn't had communion in a really long time. And so while we talked, I said it would be an honor to serve you communion today. And it was. Um, Jesus died to reconcile all things to himself. She started attending worship here again last March because of online worship. <laughs> and it was a beautiful thing to welcome her back into our family today with her daughter, and I give thanks to God for that. Praise God. May we all be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. This song that's about to be sung is called The Blessing. And it's a song that has spoke volumes to people all throughout the pandemic. Receive the blessing as they sing it to us.